Good afternoon. I'm Marshall Blaylock, and I serve as pa the pastor of First Baptist Church in Charleston, South Carolina. And I'm also chairman of the Abuse Reform Implementation Task Force. And today we have two members of that task force. To my immediate left is Brad Eubank, pastor of First Baptist in Petal, Mississippi. And then John Nelson, pastor of Soma Community Church in Jefferson City, Missouri. Two great guys, part of the task force. And so what I'd like to do is ask you a couple of questions because the theme of this particular event today is the scriptural basis and the need for sex abuse reform. And so I want to ask both of you, and you just get a chance, so don't, don't, uh, don't think you'll miss the opportunity. What are some of the scriptural principles that guide sex abuse reform in the SBC? Well, I think, Marshall, there's multiple scriptures, obviously, that we've talked about before. And uh, Proverbs 31 comes to mind, 7 and 8, that speaks up for those who cannot speak for themselves, to seek justice for those who cannot seek it for themselves. And so we have a scriptural mandate uh, to respond in a way that is biblical, in the way that Christ would respond in this particular way. And so I think the mandate is abundantly clear. I think sometimes, unfortunately, we've pitted one against the other, fulfilling the Great Commission and also handling sex abuse as the two opposite things in scripture. Uh, but Christ is so clear, I believe in his word about how we are to respond in a way that's biblical and right. It's a good word. Thanks, John. Well, I was going to say that all throughout the Old, New Testament and the Old Testament, as we uh, go throughout Isaiah, um, Isaiah 58 speaks specifically to uh, dealing with those who are oppressed and those that are abused are oppressed. Scripturally, when you look at the Hebrew word there, you're actually looking at the word that means oppressed to be abused. And those that are being uh, abused are being pushed down in Christ over and over. God, all throughout the Old Testament, the Tanakh, the Torah, all the way through, speaks very clearly about those that are oppressed and how we're to treat them and how we're to fight on their behalf because they're weak enough that we they can't fight for themselves. And so that principle goes all throughout Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, and it's our job as the body of Christ to continue to fight in that direction. Those are great answers. There's one piece of this that uh, Brad mentioned and sometimes people think there's a conflict between the Great Commission and caring well for victims of abuse or the Great Commission and prevention in efforts in churches. So talk about that, that, that uh, concept and whether it, it makes any sense in light of what you've read and what you've experienced in Scripture. I find a lot that we create dichotomies where there really aren't any. And, and here, what I mean by that is that there are places where we have either sinned uh, by our own personal sin or people around us have sinned, but it gets reflected back on us through the church. And our job as the church is to, one, see the sin, admit it, uh, e even if it's not ours. Uh, you go back to Isaiah, you see uh, him do that in the presence of God. I'm a man of unclean lips, of a people of unclean lips. He's not just, it's not just him, it's his people that are unclean. And, he's, and he admits that and says that out loud. But in doing that, it allows us to gain a hearing in a culture that needs to hear truth. Uh, I was just upstairs and some of the workers walking around, walking by said, what is this? And I happened to walk by and said, it's a Southern Baptist convention. And so we walked for about five minutes and just had a conversation about who we are, what we stand for. And if people think that we don't stand for the oppressed, for the abused, for the hurt, for the downtrodden, then they don't want to hear the good news because to us, the gospel we're giving isn't good news. Mm -hmm. The gospel has to be good news for those that are oppressed and, and pressed down as much as it is for those that are lifted up and able to pick themselves up. Mm -hmm. It's a great word. Thank you. Thank you, John. You know, Jesus talked about uh, the idea of how much he loved children. And you talk about response. The other piece of that is prevention. You know, we want to stop this scourge from happening in our churches if we possibly can. Jesus was very clear. It's better for a millstone to be hung around your neck if you cause one of these little ones to stumble. Mm -hmm. And I just on my watch, the best I can in my own church and being a part of this ARTF, we want to help our churches uh, come alongside our churches, help our churches see the need to provide protection. It's a gospel issue. We want to keep them safe. You're right. I think that's, that's a good word. So you both served now for a year on this abuse reform implementation task force. So what's been the biggest takeaway for each of you? When well, John, I'm coming to you first on this one. The biggest takeaway about the need for reform. Marshall, I'll say um, it's been a learning curve for me over this last year. Uh, I did not know or understand the statistics um, surrounding abuse the way I do now. I did not know or understand how prevalent it was. I understood it was there, 
Uh, it's even in my family. So I understand it's there. I just didn't understand how prevalent it was in our culture and the need for us to have to deal with this head on. Um, when I saw the statistic out of the uh, um, uh, out of the Department of Corrections of the recidivism rate or, or the retention rate of those who actually create abuse and go back after they get out of jail and go back to it at 89 percent, it blew my mind. And so that was a learning curve that was very steep for me to grasp. And once I started grasping that, I started looking back and going, again, how does this communicate good news to the next generation? I work a lot with college students, mm -hmm. and I want them to understand the good news of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And understanding that when we do this right, people will come into our churches hearing the good news and being able to be healed um, and walk through that. And it's not an easy process. I don't work in an no. easy area, but it's worth it because of what you get out of it. I think one of the things related to what you just said that surprised me last year and continue this year is how many people in our churches have been sexually abused. It's one in four of the women and one in six of the men, if, we, if, the, if the stats are correct. So if you're standing up in a church on Sunday and there's 100 people out there, there a quarter of them have suffered some kind of sexual abuse. It is a gospel issue because there are people in our communities that may never understand and hear the gospel. But if your church becomes a safe place to help bring healing and hope in the gospel yeah. to survivors of sex abuse, it's in a major effort for the gospel to bring people to Christ and to healing. And uh, I just never had considered that until I learned more about what's going on. So, yes, there is a need for reform. There's a need for prevention. There's a need for protection and care. It's it's pretty amazing. So, Brad, you're someone who yourself experienced sexual abuse from someone in the church as a child. And so when I asked the question, what have you learned about the need for sex abuse reform? It's almost, almost a bad question to ask you. Uh, but I know your heart. So will you share some of that and comment on the need for sex abuse reform as you see it now? Well, I'd say two things. One, I think I've learned a lot personally. Um, I think I thought um, maybe I'd reached a certain point of healing and of forgiveness and things like that. But I've realized in my own life that that for myself and other survivors, healing and forgiveness is a lifelong process. Mm -hmm. And when church comes alongside you and helps you in that process, it's pretty significant. Um, so I've been in this field, obviously, for a long time. I've been talking about it for a long time because it's part of my story. And I've been talking about it because so often we find the church, we don't talk about this topic. Um, and what I find is the reticence and the uncomfortableness that sometimes that it brings. But I will tell you in my mind, the two darkest places that the enemy uh, does in our culture is abortion and abuse. Uh, they cause the greatest pain, the greatest horror, the greatest difficulty. Um, and so I, I guess I'm surprised, but I'm learning that a lot of us want to do something about it, but we don't always want to talk about it. I shared my testimony at a church in North Mississippi a few months ago and, um, and the uncomfortableness in the room of me sharing my story raw and, and sharing what, what God has done and how God has done miraculous and wonderful things um, was extraordinary to hear. And every time that I share my story, every single time I've shared my story, at least one or more people will come up and say one of two things. Um, I have the same story or I have the same kind of experience or I've experienced abuse and the greatest statement to hear is this, is I've never told anyone until tonight, but I experienced abuse. And I've heard that from 75-year-olds. I've heard that from eight-year-olds. I've heard that from teenagers, college students. It doesn't matter. There are people that are inside of our pews that this topic is so difficult sometimes to talk about that are there. But if we'll be open enough to talk about it, I've even found pastors that are survivors like I am that are reticent to talk about it from the pulpit. And because they've been told, I was even told one time from another pastor, hey, if you talk about this, um, it could ruin your ministry. That's what he told me one time. And I'm like, why would it ruin my ministry? I didn't do anything wrong. I, I'm a victim of what's happened. I've chosen to become a survivor by God's grace. We must talk about the broken places in our lives and not just stay in the brokenness, but how Christ takes us from the brokenness and brings redemption and honor and glory for his name. That's a great word. And I appreciate your candor and being willing to talk about it. Uh, you're not the only survivor on our task force. And um, Jarrett Stevens says the exact same thing. Everywhere he's told his story, 
someone or sometimes several someones will come forward and say, it happened to me. I've never told anybody else. And it, it's heartbreaking. So one of the things that uh, people wonder is, it just won't happen at my church. People say, you know, that might happen somewhere else, but it, it's not going to happen where we are because we know each other and we all trust each other. It's going to be great. What do you tell someone who thinks it won't happen at their church? Well, I would say a couple of things, and it's a, it's a great question to ask. I've served as a rural pastor in a rural church before, um, and uh, I knew most every person in that church. The problem is, is what we think is an abuser. We often, we, we, we think we want to protect ourselves from what we call the kidnap uh, kind of perpetrator, which is so incredibly rare. It does happen, and we want to be protective against that, but it's incredibly rare. The, the most perpetrators, statistics tell us up to 93% of victims knew their perpetrator. And so when you hear that all of a sudden in a church that says, well, I know everybody, then all of a sudden you discover, well, the reality is that's the very places where perpetrators go because the thought is that perpetrators are some snurdly old guy in an overcoat in a park handing out candy to kids. And the reality is, unfortunately, that sometimes they're right inside of our churches. They're volunteers. Sometimes they're staff members. Sometimes they're pastors. They're AMSs. We just saw on the news this past weekend. Mm -hmm. And so it's happening more than what we want to know. And so I would say the fact that, it, it, not that we walk around with this, everybody's an abuser, but the fact that we're open our eyes to recognize grooming behavior and recognize who these people are. So the fact that it can't happen in my church sadly scares me that that can be sometimes the very church it can happen in the easiest because in churches, what, what we discover is church factor trust is really high. And we teach our children to respect, to listen, to learn. And so that is a good thing, but also it can open ourselves up because we are so trusting. And so when you say you know everybody because I trust everybody, the reality is uh, the high, high percentage of, of, of kids know their perpetrator. All right, so John, you're going, we're coming to you, but I want to highlight a couple of things that he said because you all need to remember what he just said. The likelihood is that the perpetrator is someone the victim knows probably pretty well. The victim's family probably knows probably pretty well. The church trusts they're not some creepy person out there that everyone's suspicious of. They're someone everybody actually trusts. And I had no idea that was the case until we've learned more about it. And I hope if you're a pastor, you never have to deal with this. I hope you never deal with it. But the likelihood is at some point in your lifetime, you'll be dealing with this and we want to help you do that. So helping the people to see, yes, it can happen. We don't want it to happen. There are prevention efforts we hope you're taking and we'll talk about that in a moment. So it won't happen, Lord willing, but it can and does. I was in a meeting the other day in our association um, and it was a small group just talking about different things. And three churches came to me in one meeting saying, we've got this situation. What do we do? That's three churches in one small meeting. It was going on right this minute. So yes, it can happen. It's sad. Now, John, I just gave you another shot at it. So so what do you tell churches that think it just can't happen here? If um, a pastor, and I've had this happen, um, so I'll just tell you my exact response to him. Uh, he said, this can't happen in my church. We have 70 people in our church. I know everybody, grandmas, great grandmas. I know every single person. And I told him, I said, brother, I love you, but you've created the perfect environment for this to thrive. You've created the perfect environment for this to thrive. And you don't mean it. You don't, it's very unintentional, but that's what you've done because you created a, a, a trust factor that says it can't happen here. We're not going to go and do background checks, which still don't catch everybody because not everybody's listed on it. Not every state works with a national database. So even if you do that and we're not teaching people the behaviors of individuals uh, that, that groom. I mean, my, my wife and I did something kind of scary uh, when I jumped on the task force. We went on the sex offender registry where it tells you where everybody is. Mm -hmm. And in our neighborhood, a great looking neighborhood, seems safe as all get out. Kids walk around, dogs play all the time. I got one next door. Had no idea. Talked to the young man, had great conversation with him. He's a nice guy. Surprised me. It's on the Internet right there. You don't know who that person is. You don't know their story. You don't know their background. We think we know all the time. And here's the thing. We're not trying to make everybody a suspect. And not every groomer is walking around in a windowless white van, right? Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is we're trying to create uh, uh, um, identity 
so that people understand what a groomer is and what grooming activities are. And when they begin to, uh, to exhibit those behaviors, we can nip it in the bud so it never happens. Versus on the back end going, oh my goodness, what do we do now that we've heard? What do we do and now that we jump into protect our church, protect that family, protect that individual, and that's when we start making mistakes. Let's prevent this before it ever happens. Create the policies, the procedures, the training, and that's part of our job is helping us and our states, um, and we're on the state task force, helping our states to create those, uh, um, those policies and procedures so that you follow them, so that we don't have these, uh, these uh, problems when they come up. Yeah. We hate to do the back end, we'd rather do the front end, but we're gonna prepare for both. So uh, thank you, John, great answer. And thanks for bringing it home in terms of personal situations. In our church, we have a school and roughly 20 years ago, we had a teacher who was sexually assaulting a seventh grade kid. And when we found out, we went to the police, he got put in jail, all the right stuff. But I was deeply grieved when someone came to me and said, you know, we saw this coming. I'm like, well, wait a minute. You saw, you saw grooming behavior and you didn't tell anybody? You got to recognize it before it happens. There's a church in our area also that uh, is, is, um, has a student who's been assaulted by the youth minister, a married youth minister, and no one believed it could happen but they saw the grooming behavior and did nothing about it because he's a high trust person. You got to, you got to notice it so you can stop it. So can it happen? Yes, it can. So let me ask you this. What's the most important advice you can give a pastor on this issue? What's the most important advice you could give to a pastor? Wake up to the realities of what's going on in our world. And I don't, I, I don't want to say that in a mean way. I just want to say that as a brother to a brother. We need to wake up to the realities of what's going on in the world around us. And the reality is, is this is pervasive in our society. There's perversion all around us. And it is our job to be prepared as shepherds to, to, to tend to our sheep and to shoot the wolves. And the only way we can do that is being prepared and being awakened to what is going on around us. I am more awakened and more aware of that now than I ever have been before. And I pray that it happens more and more in our convention. But as long as we sit back and say, it'll never happen here, it's probably where it's going to happen next. And it'll break my heart. It happens day in. I think each of us have taken phone calls almost every week of another church that that's happened or see it in the news. And I don't want to see any more. I don't want it to be in our convention anymore. We want to get this out, but the only way we can do that is to open our eyes to the reality of what's going on so we can be prepared to shoot the wolves when they come amongst our sheep. You know, I think sometimes we, we, we can stick our heads in the sand. We can uh, hope this won't happen, think it won't happen. Um, encourage pastors to learn more about this. There's our state conventions. Many of them have done an incredible job of preparing resources and preparing uh, policy procedures, all those things we've talked about. They can use in their church and learn more about this particular topic. I mean, the, the, when I share stats in meetings that we've been in, you've heard the reaction in the room uh, that the average male abuser who abuses girls is averages 52 victims. A uh, male abuser who abuses boys averages 150 victims. The gas that comes out in the room is nothing short of extraordinary. And so if we'll educate ourselves, we'll know more about this topic. We don't have to become experts in it. But we can just read five or 10 statistics, know what's happening in your county, Talk to the local uh, child advocacy center in your area, the local family court, CPS, sheriff's office, whatever it is in your in your area, and ask them the question: What is what is happening in our area about this? And I think people will be shocked to know in our culture that unfortunately the culture creeps into our churches because people are fallen and they're sinful and they will use the gospel. Sadly, they'll use the gospel to gain access to their kids, yeah. to kids. And in my case. Um, the guy, our, my perpetrator was a, a fourth brother in our family. He was accepted as a part of our family. He weaved his way into his family. He ingratiated himself and he manipulated to get access. And so we've got to help people know and understand how to recognize what you mentioned, that grooming behavior. All right. So prevention. If you had to tell a church or a pastor, here's the one most important thing to do to prevent sex abuse happening in your church. What would it be? Now, you're going to say it's got to be more than one, but start with one. <laughs> well, 
I, I would say the one that it's not is it's the one we always talk about that's always first. And, and John already alluded to it. It's not it's not the it's not the background check, though. That's important. And every church needs to do them. I would say this is so we'll clarify. We want everybody to do background. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. That is not the number one most important. It's got to be done. But it's for it me, not it's be not. The most and I will tell you why. I, I, I didn't know anything about um, anything about all I'd learned in seminary was this is how you recognize a, a, a person who has been abused after the fact. And in 2013, I met Greg Love with Ministry Safe, and I was sharing my testimony at a church in Mississippi. And I heard that we could actually learn to recognize grooming behavior. We could, there, were, there were patterns. There were ways that you could watch people. And all of a sudden, I'm like, holy cow, I wish I'd have known this a long time ago. Because now we can actually spot and learn. So learning how to recognize the patterns, and they're there. And they're not very, they're pretty obvious. It's like what your person talked about. Oh, we, 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 we were not surprised. Yeah. Right. But we saw it coming. What did you see coming? And you go back and you interview and they say, well, we saw this. We saw this. We saw this. We saw risky behavior. We saw them. All, perhaps we wondered why they were always alone. We wonder why they were favoring this person and they were giving them gifts or uh, there was uh, oftentimes there's pornography involved or there's alcohol involved or there's nudity involved. There's always this way. And what they do is and, and I've seen it happen in my life and in the lives of other survivors I've talked to. That perpetrator is just trying to see how close can they get and where the tolerance is of that child in particular of where they can push the envelope. And so if we can teach our pastors, if we can teach our families and our parents to teach their kids, one of the things I talk about with my kids all the time is to understand about what is proper touch and not proper touch, right? Mm -hmm. So helping recognize the behaviors so that the minute that it starts, mm -hmm. uh, West Virginia, by the way, has laws now in the state of West Virginia, if I understand it correctly from the, the folks there, that they have laws against grooming behavior. Good. And so they want to nip it in the bud before it ever even gets started. So that's what I would say. So there's a, there's one piece of advice for churches. Find out and learn how to recognize the behavior that leads up to sex abuse, grooming behavior. And uh, that's an important piece of this. And one of the things, that if any of you have signed up to be a volunteer with the International Mission Board, they actually have video training you've got to go through to get on the mission team Just as a volunteer it. and it trains about how to recognize this kind of behavior so you're right i think that's a that's a great answer so john top brad's answer please <laughs> well i know brad that had a much. good one but much. let me no. <laughs> i i you know i from a pastoral perspective and we're all pastors up here we have a lot on our plates um, especially the smaller church you are. I'm, I'm a small church pastor, so you got, you know, finances and volunteers and, you know, somehow I got to find a way to do the background checks and the training and the, I mean, everything. Even now I'm social media manager and all that stuff. I mean, you got everything you have to do. But we find the time to learn behaviors of everything. You, you know the, you know the person that's going to come up to you 30, uh, three minutes before you go up to preach to tell you about their week. It happens every single time. Any pastor ever had that happen to you? Pastor, let me tell you about what happened this week. You're like, Lord, not now. I'm about to go preach. But I just need to tell you, right? It happens every time. You know what happens when you had little kids and they run into the corner and turn red, right? We learn behaviors constantly. We know what's going on. We understand it. And we can do that in this thing. It's not that hard. I think uh, IMB's done a great job with their Go Method. Um, and I just went through that before I went to Brazil. I had to go through it again. And, and it's just a great refresher. Once again, as a matter of fact, when I was going through it, I texted my wife and said, I think we need to talk to somebody about an, a situation because it just reminded me again, which is the purpose of doing it at least once a year. That's been a year since I did it last to remind me again. It's those refreshers to remind you once again of what that is and then to take it to your congregation. We can learn these behaviors, but on top of all of that, we can also fight false narratives in our life. And those false narratives, it's not going to happen to me. Those false narratives of listening to Anything on social media, the false narratives of this has nothing to do with the gospel. It has everything to do with it because our good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ has to be good news to those who are oppressed, hurt, and downtrodden. And we can offer care, comfort, and healing. We can offer healing through the gospel because the world doesn't have that. We have a monopoly on it. And when we don't care well for them, we don't offer, that, uh, we don't offer the good news of Jesus Christ. Those are, those are two great answers. I want to make note for every one of you here that you just, you heard it here first. Not everything on social media is true. Did you? <laughs> Amen. Thank, thank you, John, Amen. for clearing that up for us. That's I do shocking. appreciate That's that. Shocking. Pretty amazing stuff right there, and, uh, and but also true, by the way. 
And the part about repetition, um, I'm the chairman of the task force. I started on the task force last year. I went through the GO method for IMB twice. I've had three background checks. So I've gone through the system. Our church requires me to get background checks every two years. All this stuff, I go through the training. And it's still helpful. I've done it more than once. But it's still helpful to keep it in mind to watch for these things. It's a great answer. Thank you for both of those. All right, so we don't have much time left. So what's the biggest mistake a church can make on this issue? The biggest mistake. Now, we've already said thinking it can't happen here. That's probably the biggest one. It can't happen here. That may be the biggest. What After that? Thinking we've hit the finish line. And this goes back to what we were just talking about. We can go through all the different steps that we're going to put out tomorrow. We're going to go through all the different things we can learn and, and go through the different training and whoever, uh, you know, whoever we, we partner with for our training. And, and we can do all that, but then we think we hit the finish line. When we get the background check and the training and everything's good and you're good and you're good and everything's great. No, no, no. That's the beginning. You, you, you got to keep going. And, and you, you kind of keep pushing. And, and, we, and we know this, pastors. You guys all know this. That is the second that you start getting sick and tired of hearing yourself saying it is about the second when people actually start hearing it. I have put out social media posts on multiple platforms. I put out newsletters. I posted. I have posters above the urinals in our ba in our bathrooms at our church that let you know what's going on. And still, I'll have people come up to me and go, well, I had no idea we're doing that. Why? Because they're just unaware and they have so much in their life and it's our job to continue to shepherd them well, to call them back into the flock because our job is never done. And as soon as we have everybody in our flock, guess what? If God is doing what he does and we're doing what we do, we have somebody else to add to train now. And so to think that we've hit the end, we don't hit the end until we go home to be the Lord. Until that point, we have to be keep, on guard keep and fighting. vigilant. Keep yes. fighting. That's, That's right. good. Brad? I, I would say this. I think sometimes we think um, we forget that there are laws that we've got to report. Um, we think that we'll just handle this in house as a church and uh, we'll do Matthew 18 and we'll use this and this needs to be forgiven and forgotten. And it's just a, a mistake that somebody made. And the reality is um, that's not the truth. And if we know of, of the abuse, whether your law requires or not, uh, in my personal opinion, you ought to report known or suspected abuse. In many states it's required, but even if it's not required, I would encourage people to report, um, but also to care as a church. And I think the biggest mistake we can make is to, to minimize it, uh, to say that it's not that big of a deal, um, and, and to say we just need to forgive and forget. In my situation, the church that was involved, um, uh, well, not the church later on where this person ended up, you wouldn't believe the hostility that I faced as a survivor and as a victim from people who said, you should have let this go. I had a pastor call me and said, you know what? This person's been through enough. Um, you need to drop this. And I said, I'm not doing anything. I mean, it's the, the courts have taken hold of it. The, the law enforcement have taken hold of it. And I said, justice is going to take its course. That's biblical. And, uh, and so I think the mistake we can make is to try to internalize it, handle it ourselves. We're not equipped to handle it. We, we're, we need to turn it over to law enforcement, to those that can handle that, and then take care of those inside of our body who've been wounded. It's a good word. We're winding up our time, but I, I don't want to end the, end the time without you saying a word to survivors. There may be folks standing right here that are survivors of sex abuse. What would you say? You ask that. I was hoping you'd ask that. So I, I would say this. Um, my, my encouragement to you is, is that we're working as a task force and I'm praying as a convention. We're in the middle of a culture change and the change culture takes time. It won't happen overnight. And if you'll give it time, we're going to get there. But I, I will tell you the thing that I quoted to my perpetrator in open court. And I was able to address my perpetrator and I quoted to him in Genesis 50, 20. It's really become one of my life verses, but also this phrase of only God can take the broken, horrible, difficult places in our life and make something beautiful out of them. And so I told him and I quoted to him, Genesis 50, 20, Joseph tells his brothers what you meant for evil. And I added what Satan meant for evil. God meant for good. And I've seen nothing but God do incredible good out of my life. That's brought me to the point where I'm 51 years old, sitting on this stage, being a part of an ARTF. God knew that this day would come in my life 40 years ago when all these things happened. We say, well, where was God? God was in the middle of it. God was preparing me for this moment to be a part of this opportunity. So I would say to survivors, God's going to heal you. God can restore you. God can redeem and set you free and give us time. We're going to keep working on this as a convention. We're going to get better. We're about out of time. Well, I don't want to add anything to that. I don't want to add anything to that. It's a good word. Brad, thank you. If you are a survivor, know that uh, this is a safe place here. 
we love you and we want to do all we can to bless and serve each of you. That's our goal. Ultimately, we want to bring glory to God and help our churches get this right. Thanks for letting us be part of uh, your afternoon this afternoon. God's blessing each one of you.